Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining the Canadian Chamber of Commerce's webinar on uh, foreign direct investment and the role that uh, it will play in Canada's economic recovery from COVID-19. My name is Mark Agnew. I'm the Senior Director, International Policy at the Canadian Chamber. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here to join us. In terms of the structure of the webinar, we'll have our moderator, Ian Mackay, who will uh, start us off with some opening remarks, and then he'll moderate a discussion amongst our panel before turning it over to the audience Q&A. And of course, just before we get underway, I'd also like to extend a thanks to all of our speakers for making the time, and also to our sponsor, Raven Charbot uh, Grant Thornton, for their contribution to the Chamber to make this webinar possible. So with that, Ian, I'll pass it over to you. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mark, and good day, everybody. My name is Ian McKay. I'm the CEO of Invest in Canada, and it's a real honour and delight to offer some opening remarks and to moderate uh, this panel of very distinguished guests, from which we're all going to learn a lot. Um, but first, I'd like to thank the Chamber of Commerce, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, its leadership, its management, its membership, and all of you who have joined us today for really a very topical and important discussion. Um, before we get to the panelists' introductions, just some brief opening remarks. Uh, Invest in Canada was launched in 2018 um, with a clear mandate to promote, to facilitate, and to accelerate a large-scale and transformative transformational investments uh, into and all across Canada. Uh, and we also recognize we have a, a thought leadership role uh, in terms of discussing the importance of FDI to Canada, to Canadians, and to communities all across the country. Uh, very briefly, the state of affairs with FDI in Canada, um, currently the snapshot is very positive. Um, last month, my organization released the first FDI report uh, which is a comprehensive story of the data and what the FDI is doing in Canada. And I would encourage all of you to follow our social media channels and have a look at the report um, to get a sense of what FDI is meaning to Canada. 2019, as it happens, was the best year of FDI in Canada since 2013. We recruited about $67 billion of foreign direct investment. That's about a 20% uh, increase over 2018 and about a 90% increase over 2017, and about a 46% jump over the 10-year average. So the current snapshot is that the trend is, is quite positive. Now, $67 billion is a data point on its own. It doesn't mean much until you compare it in an apples-to-apples -apples way to what our competitors are doing. And the OECD does that by measuring FDI in each country as a percentage of a, as a ratio to its population, and to the size of its economy, the GDP. So in 2019, Canada certainly ranked uh, number one in FDI per capita and per GDP. Um, in fact, we're recruiting investment at a pace that's about 2.5 times the pace of that currently in the United States. And maybe we can discuss some of the reasons uh, for that. Now, the pandemic has changed all of that. Uh, we know that 2020, the OECD and the United Nations Committee on Trade and Development had forecast that FDI globally would drop between 40 and 50 percent. In fact, after quarter three, which is the last quarter we have numbers for, in developed economies, FDI is down more than 70 percent. Uh, into the United States, it's down about 62 percent. And of course, it's down in Canada as well on the year over year. We're down about 31 percent. So we've been impacted for sure but I think a little more resilient than a lot of our competitors. Um, there's a couple, if you consider um, the COVID uh, pandemic to be an externality in, in terms of our ability to recruit FDI, I think there's another couple of externalities that we're living with that will continue and outlive COVID. One of course is climate change and what is that doing to uh, uh, supply chain hubs around the world? And the other of course is G. ESG, the Environmental, Social and Governance Framework, through which we know through loads of empirical data, is the framework through which more and more global capital is being directed. And so how does Canada position itself as a jurisdiction, um, as a purveyor of certain sectors of the economy, and right down to the company level, how are we positioning ourselves in the ESG framework to be more attractive to the capital that is flowing based on ESG principle? Um, there will be some shifting in global supply change. The debate is still out there whether 
the supply chain matrix that we've all become addicted to, which is a low cost driven, just in time delivery supply chain, will there be regionalization? Will there be reshoring? Which has been a debate that's happened really since the beginning of the pandemic and is still ongoing. In either scenario, I think there's a few sectors where Canada has some ability to position itself very prominently. Um, if there's shifting in supply chains, jurisdictions with strengths in digital economy, whether it's AI or 3D technologies, virtual reality, blockchain, all of those digital tools will be used to reform supply chains going forward. Um, life sciences, company, uh, countries and companies are gonna make sure they're not vulnerable to supply chain disruptions. We've seen uh, three or four significant uh, pharmaceutical investments into Canada since the on uh, onslaught of the pandemic. Certainly advanced manufacturing with the new and uh, the reassurance of the NAFTA, the USMCA. Uh, the hydrogen economy, which virtually every country and every sector of the economy is very, very uh, keen to move forward. What are Canada's opportunities there? And of course, agriculture and the technology that goes into accelerating Canada's uh, agri agricultural space. So we'll get into a whole lot of this and more with our distinguished panelists, which I'll introduce now uh, alphabetically. First is Laurel Broughton. Uh, Laurel, of course, is the president and CEO of Nova Scotia Business Inc., which is a provincial crown corporation responsible for export development, uh, business and film financing, and investment attraction for Nova Scotia. Malcolm Bruce is the inaugural CEO of Edmonton Global, which is the regional economic development corporation that drives growth and investment in the investment region. And uh, finally, a great thanks to our sponsor, Emilio Abrilio, who is the president and CEO of Raymond Chabot Grant Thornton, who everybody knows is a leading professional services firm active in Quebec, Ontario, New Brunswick, but who's dealing with companies all across Canada and multinationals who are operating in Canada. So welcome to our panelists. And uh, I'll start with a question for each of you, um, starting with some of the good news. Certainly we'll get into some of the challenges uh, later, but from your own personal perspective, what do you consider to be the biggest advantage um, that Canada has to attract foreign direct investment? And perhaps color that with some of your local or personal success stories. Uh, Laurel, if I could start that one with you. Hi, Ian, and uh, hello to everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you today here from my office in Halifax. Um, and as you can see from the flags behind me, um, at NSBI, we sell Nova Scotia, uh, but ultimately we're all selling Canada. Um, I am an individual who's been privileged to live right across the country. I've lived in Saskatchewan, I've lived in Alberta, I've lived in Montreal, I've lived in Toronto uh, for many years. And so one of the things that we know that all of us across Canada sell um, is our quality of life. Um, a, huge, a, a huge value add uh, to the work that we do to talk about you know, where we live and, and certainly there's unique uh, aspects to that story, uh, you know, here in Nova Scotia, we're surrounded by the ocean. Uh, we, you know, you're probably half an hour away from a beach at any time at most uh, as, as you travel around the province. Uh, we have a, an incredibly successful university system uh, with 10 universities and 13 community colleges. So a high a number of technical graduates for this new, uh, you know, technology based world. Um, and in addition, uh, for us right now, we certainly are talking about Canada's global connections and the fact that we are a jurisdiction with um, free trade agreements uh, with, frankly, um, you know, the majority of the world. And so for us in Nova Scotia, we're a small jurisdiction. You are not going to necessarily be coming to Nova Scotia and say that you want to sell your products and services to this market. You're looking to this market to be your beachhead to other parts of the world. So whether those other parts are Europe, whether those other parts are the United States or other countries with whom we have agreements, that's a huge component of what we talk to our clients about. Um, I wanna just uh, highlight one other, uh, uh, you know, two other elements that have really changed as a result of the pandemic. We are now seeing um, 
you know, the vast majority of Canadians, many, many Canadians in professional service firms or in technology firms who are working from home. And so that work from home is something now that we need to add into our mix uh, on an FDI conversation. You might not be an employer who's looking to set up a major operation. What you might want to be doing now as a result of COVID-19 is looking for a jurisdiction where your workforce can, can successfully work from home. And so broadband connectivity, good internet, all of those things are setting Canada apart from many other parts of the world. Um, the last piece um, that is, I think, unique to uh, Atlantic Canada now, although I would say, you know, we are living through a, a, a blip of uh, COVID wave two, um, throughout the pandemic, we have really been identified as a COVID safer jurisdiction. Uh, we've been in the office most of the time. Our case count uh, yesterday was an additional four cases in each of the Atlantic Canadian provinces. So that's been a piece of a conversation that we've been having with companies around the world as they look to, you know, where would they want to set up future operations? Um, and we don't take it for granted. We are in a, a two week circuit breaker to get rid of uh, uh, COVID and what we are, are living through right now. Uh, but I think uh, how Canada responds to COVID-19 is also a critical piece of the value proposition and the conversation that we have globally. So. Maybe with that, I'll, I'll leave those uh, remarks and look forward to more questions from you, Ian. For sure. Thanks, Laura. I think you touched on a really important point that um, investors are starting to recognize, uh, whether it's Nova Scotia or, or Canada in general, is that we're no longer being viewed as a, a country with a population of market size of 38 million people. We're being viewed as a marketplace with access to 1.5 billion consumers through Canada's free trade footprint, which I think is an understated uh, value proposition but we're now hearing it more and more and more from global investors that that 1.5 billion number really, really hits home. Uh, Malcolm, let's move to you in terms of, uh, as an opener, um, your personal professional perspective, what are some of the biggest advantages Canada has and um, what are some of the positive stories? Uh, thanks, Ian, and thank you to the Chamber for the kind invitation. I really look forward to sharing these few minutes with everybody here on the uh, on the call. So first of all, just so everybody's aware, I also am the board chair for the Consider Canada City Alliance. And that alliance is the 12 largest regional metro economies across the country. And in scale and scope, they represent over 2014 to 2019, 84% of all the new FIDs, so all the new foreign direct investment into this country occurred in those 12 metropolitan regions. So it's a significant uh, factor in the economic wealth and creation that occurs in Canada. So some of what I will speak about comes from that experience as well with my colleagues across the country, from Halifax to Vancouver and everything in between. So I just wanna talk a little bit about what uh, Ian has raised of three key aspects that I think site selectors, who are, as you know, many of you are aware, are proxies for um, multinational companies looking to expand or to grow. And these three are the digitization of the supply chain. So essentially, if you're not digitizing, you're not going to be allowed into the supply chain. Because as we have found through COVID, that digitization gives you visibility and allows you to be much more agile in terms of your ability to shift and move and be flexible. The second one is that point of reshoring versus redundancy. And I think, you know, the idea of reshoring is going to be happening in some cases, like in health and life sciences, we've seen the investment in uh, PPE, but it's not gonna be in all things, given the, uh, the depth and scale of which uh, our global supply chains are so integrated. That said, I think that the redundancy comment by Ian is very important because I think what you'll see is really a bulking out in areas down the supply chain to build some resiliency in those supply chains in, in case of disruption. So that resiliency and redundancy in the supply chain is going to be important. And where Canada is very, very well positioned is our connectedness. And it goes back to that 1.5 billion customers but also in terms of our integrated networks here within North America, uh, as well as globally. And then finally, there's a point that uh, the third point raised by site selectors are 
what they call a secondary community or smaller community. And these communities are representative such as Edmonton, Halifax, not Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. Those would be considered more global or bigger. But what they are expecting is to see companies starting to look to some of these smaller markets to move their companies to where talent is being produced, uh, as opposed to moving talent to where they're producing things. And some of it is about affordability. Some of it is about quality of life, as was already mentioned. Uh, and these are important factors. Now, the only caveat I will put on that is we need to connect, connect these communities. And right now, as you know, the federal government has limited international travel to four airports, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, and um, uh, Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, and Calgary. Um, and so for the other markets like Ottawa, ourselves, Halifax, these things will have an impediment unless they get lifted very shortly. Now, in regards to the Edmonton metropolitan region, there's a couple of things many people perhaps don't realize. The University of Alberta is ranked number three globally for artificial intelligence, globally. And uh, if none of you have heard Dr. Shapiro, you may want to just look him up because he is at the cusp of being able to solve diabetes in the next three to five years. And for those that don't know, diabetes is affecting about 450 million people and about 350 million more are on the cusp of, uh, of having diabetes. And he's this close to creating a cure. And it all stems out of the Edmonton Protocol back in uh, 2000, or correction, 2000 and, uh, and uh, two, in the year 2000. So these are the kind of things that people need to pay attention to because they are what the emerging economy is going to be. And I know Alberta is known for oil and gas, and I think hydrogen was mentioned. But there are other things that are going on through our research universities, as well as some of the advanced technologies going on in agriculture. And I will close with agriculture. The Dutch have 4.4 million acres under uh, agricultural production, and they gross out about $150 billion a year out of that 4.4 million acres. In the Edmonton metropolitan region alone, we have 1.7 million acres of uh, class one, class two soils. And we only tap out at $7.3 billion of GDP growth. So the agricultural market is poised to have significant expansion in this country if we can start moving from price takers on our raw products to price makers and value add products. And we see this as a real sort of uh, change for Canada. Uh, but in particular for Alberta and uh, and more particularly for the Edmonton Metropolitan Region. Thank you, Ian. Uh, thanks, Bob. And some of the great points you've raised there, and amongst them, of course, the the enormous requirement for all of us to do the promotional work that we're doing. Um, some of the better known elements of Canada, some of the lesser known elements of Canada. Investment starting to pursue, in many respects, talent and talents choosing to live where they want to live. And so there are significant opportunities coming forward. Now, um, Emilio, your, you, you and your company through your work are speaking to more companies probably than all of us combined, uh, just because of the of your footprint. But give us some perspective through those discussions, what you or they might consider some of Canada's biggest advantages, some so, of the local that you know about. And we can get to some of the challenges for, for sure, but. Um, you've got a very unique perspective on this. Well, perhaps I'll, I'll start by uh, uh, transporting people in my uh, everyday life so they understand where my perspectives come from. Uh, they're fueled primarily as CEO of the Demont Chabot Grand Thornton. Um, our firm and our network uh, in Quebec, we have 2,800 people, over 100 offices. But across Canada, we have over 160 offices and 5,000 people. We're also, I sit on the board uh, and I'm the chair of the uh, budget committee for uh, Grand Thornton International. And that is 56,000 people in 140 countries. Uh, I'm gonna come at it, uh, Ian, from two points of view. Uh, one is SMEs. So in Canada, we have 100,000 SMEs. Uh, we're largest in Canada from Quebec way out east. So those five provinces, and we're one of the largest in the country. So we certainly have a perspective on SMEs better than any other category. The other angle I'd like to take, if you permit, is talk about immigrant investors, and there's quite a history in Canada with regards to those. 
Um, I, I've had personally, I, I was head of the corporate finance unit uh, for many years before being CEO. So I, I worked on numerous uh, greenfield and M&A projects. I also worked on infrastructure investments. So I have a pretty good grasp of the kinds of things that uh, uh, entrepreneurs coming into uh, Canada, what are they looking for? Or people coming into Canada, what, the, what they're looking for. So there's things we take for granted. For example, a solid legal system. And that is not everywhere like that. So if you're coming into a competitive environment and you're regulated by World, World Trade Organization, you like to know that you're in a country where you can have recourse to legal systems. That's one of the things that's under, understated. M many of the immigrants come from areas where they don't have that. And of course, they want access to labor. We talked about uh, specialized labor. We talked about artificial intelligence. I'll, I'll try not to repeat what was already said. And they're also looking for raw materials, depending on what they're doing. They want access to raw materials. Um, and sometimes those raw materials are, are heavy, not really transportable. And this is a very, very rich uh, country in terms of raw materials. And we're getting better and better every year at, um, at doing it in a far more responsible uh, fashion for future uh, generations. Um, the tax system uh, includes all kinds of um, of uh, R&D credits and subsidies. Uh, it, there's an access to international markets that was mentioned before. Um, Canadians are not uh, as commercial as some of the foreigners that come here, and they can really appreciate what the access to um, the Pacific, to the yeah. US, to Europe, uh, and what that means. They appreciate it for some reason quicker, and we need to catch up and get better at that, but that's a different subject. And then they have children, so they're looking for quality of education, safety, political stability. We have that, uh, an exemplary quality of life, a uh, charter of rights and freedoms, which maybe they're coming for, from a country where they have less of that. So those are the ty types of things that motivate uh, um, them to come, to be attracted to Canada. I'd also say that Canada is considered on a global basis one of the largest economies. It's not... There's a reason we're G20, there's a really reason we're G9, and there's a reason we were G7, uh, and that's because we rank right up there in terms of, uh, of, uh, of size, and size counts for them. Um, I, I'd also say that we have a peculiar situation, and this is the COVID pandemic. You mentioned how, uh, in your own work, Ian, um, countries and enterprises and entrepreneurs uh, suddenly became very lucid, uh, lucid with regards to what was most important. Mm -hmm. And many of the times it was to focus on their activities in whichever country that was taking place and maybe put to the side for a time uh, investment into other markets. It takes time and so and, and investment and cost money. So trying to convert, uh, conserve uh, cash to be able to do that. Um, right now we have an interesting situation and that's that um, the Canadian government's done an excellent job at creating an artificial economy and buying time so that entrepreneur, entrepreneurs can survive this period. Uh, that won't last forever. And it also creates uh, two types of budgets. One is a regular operating budget that needs to be balanced. And another one is a COVID driven budget of around $400 billion that was talked about by Christian Freeland uh, uh, a week ago. And, and uh, I think they need to be looked at independently. Uh, I believe foreign direct investment can be an, a huge, huge opportunity for the second. Uh, it may be a, a, in the form of immigration. So, for example, investor immigration. We've limited the numbers in a very significant way over the course of the last decade, from 2014 to today. Used to be over 20,000 immigrant investors a year. We're now around 2,000, less than 2,000 a year. Uh, I think that's one of the areas. And the second one is uh, employment creation through Greenfield or M&A. M&A always has its own, its own sets of attributes, which I'm sure we'll address uh, during the conversation today. And um, I believe that some of the uh, out-of-the-box ideas could be to use the Infrastructure Development Bank, for which there's $10 billion to be spent over the next three years, such that the, um, the um, cash flows for immigrants might be used to fuel part of that. Uh, I think that we can tap into um, the baby boomers RRSPs so that we allow them maybe to take it out a little earlier 
because they're going to take it out at lower tax rates and opt to pay the taxes up front. But we really need to look at big ticket items. $400 billion is in excess of 40,000 uh, 40, for taxpayer. And the Canadian taxpayers are, don't have that kind of money to fork out. So it's got to come from some other source. Yeah, so many wonderful points there, Emilio. Thank you. I, I could I could go into so many of them deeply. I'll I'll pick on one of them, which is, you know, some of the attributes that FDI brings to any country, including Canada, is it brings, you know, the deployment of new and different technologies. It brings different styles of management. It brings access to markets where Canada has a free trade footprint, but maybe not so much connective tissue. And you're tying this importance of immigrants coming into Canada under some immigrant investor uh, program to take advantage of all, all of those things. The other point you raised was the tax, uh, the overall tax regime. I think one of the less known facts is that, um, you know, the most significant tax measure that many investors look at for big projects is the marginal effective tax rate, which in Canada is about 13 and a half percent, five points lower than the United States. And so we have many of these significant advantages that we've got to sort of tell a bigger and broader story uh, around. Ian, Ian, if you permit, I'd add one of the best financial systems in the world, banking, um, yeah. labor-sponsored funds, um, pension-sponsored funds, access to capital. It, that's huge for them. Yeah, I agree. I think a lot of our investors appreciate those attributes more than we do domestically, but it's a very, very good point. So, Laurel, I come back to you. You know, some of the initiatives that federal and provincial governments successfully over many years and decades have put forth have been very well received by the investor community. Um, certainly, the free trade footprint we've talked about, um, the uh, SIF and TRED and other programs like that, the focus on innovation and education. Um, what do we need to do more of? And what are we lacking? What are we missing in that suite of products that your clients are talking to you about? You know, one of the things I think that we haven't talked about yet on this call um, that is a, a driving factor, especially as we live during a pandemic, is our conversation about our national health care system and the strength of, of health offerings in Canada. That is often a piece that is brought to the table, um, especially now. Um, I want to pick up on sustainability, and then you talked about environmental social governance. Um, I actually brought environmental social governance to the floor of the legislature in Ontario 15 years ago when people didn't even know those three words strung together what they might mean. And since then, um, they, they've gotten life to them and, and Canada's really picked up on them. Uh, the issues that you raised in your opening uh, about climate change have kind of been maybe pushed off the back burner a little bit uh, as a result of, of COVID-19. But I remember not many months ago where students across the country uh, were raising and telling us that they, as the consumers of tomorrow, were going to be increasingly demanding of what was the footprint of the products uh, and service that they were buying. And so that needs to come back on the front burner agenda. And, you know, that's a piece of uh, something that we work on at NSBI. Um, we have... Um, Malcolm talked about, uh, uh, you know, famous uh, profs and doctors out west. Well, we have Dr. Jeffrey Don, and Dr. Don um, has one of the only agreements with Tesla and is doing that battery research uh, here with Dalhousie University. That's an example of something that's going to drive our economy into the future in a sustainable way. Um, tied to the super clusters. X-Ocean, um, a, a new entrant into the uh, market, is doing work to have an uncrewed uh, surface vessel uh, that will be uh, carbon neutral, uh, you know, going out in the oceans. And so all those things are critically important. So I think Canada's strong position, um, and I would say Nova Scotia's strong position when it comes to the environment, are key factors of value proposition that we talk to global companies about. No one wants to come and make something in Nova Scotia if their footprint uh, is going to be unacceptable to their ultimate customer. So I think that's a, another piece that uh, is a part of this uh, global conversation and FDI puzzle. There is no question, you know, uh, investment decisions, final investment decisions that companies make, multinationals make, sovereign wealth funds make, you know, we're used to them being made by an investment committee at the board, um, and that's our lens. And what we're learning is that those investment decisions are now being very strongly influenced by the 
the board of the organization, its shareholders, its governance committee, and its customers, to your point, Laurel, where people want to know that the smartphone they have in their hands every day or the EV battery that's going to be driving their car um, or the resources that are coming out of the ground to build any consumer product uh, need to be sustainable. And if the customers are making that decision because of the generational impact you suggested, this really um, compels Canada and all of us to put forth the advantages Canada has there and to very, very quickly identify the weaknesses. Um, they're going to cost us some final investment decisions. But Malcolm, to you, the I've talked about the ESG thing. I'm sure it comes up a lot in your discussions, but what are your thoughts on the evolution of how investment decisions are making in terms of sectors and factors that are influencing those decisions? I kind of articulated under the phrase of investment readiness. And I think, you know, from a Canadian perspective, we've talked a lot about the positives, but I would also say to you that we still have a lot of constraints that doesn't allow us to unleash the fullest potential of the country. Uh, Interprovincial trade barriers is a classic comment that we continue to look at and if you believe the conference board of canada or the oseed they're talking about four percent gdp growth if we just sorted out our interprovincial trade barrier four percent gdp growth internal to this country that's kind of one the other one is some of the infrastructure challenges getting products to market so i'm in asia i'm in china specifically last year and a three billion dollar investor looks at me and says don't even talk to me about energy you can't get it to me Right, so so you've got to remember from a global perspective, looking at our country, we may think we've got all these ducks lining up, but there's a couple of challenges we need to solve. And finally, talent. And I think we talk a lot about immigrant talent coming in, but we have a lot of talent in this country that likes to move, and yet the ability to move and get your certifications recognized from province to province to province is a real hindrance. So I think. You know, if we could elevate our game on investment readiness, I think you would find that that really starts to send a message clearly to international investors to say, there are some things. And ESG is a great example. And we were just talking to, uh, I had a conference call with Global Affairs and your organization and NRCAN about hydrogen. And one of the key outcomes of that is we need to get on the front foot about hydrogen and the ESG message because we're not there with the rest of our energy sector. And uh, what we can't afford is for hydrogen, which is going to transition us to that low carbon economy, uh, to be put in the same scope as, uh, as the oil sands or other things in this province. So I think these are critical conversations that we need to have now, particularly as we go through this energy transition uh, across this country. Yeah, I think your phrase is really super helpful, investor readiness, and the direct link to trade corridor infrastructure. Um, I truly believe that, you know, the Gulf Coast and some of the major ports um, in the Asia Pacific, you know, they're being battered by increasingly severe and numerous climate events, typhoons, hurricanes. You know, there's going to be a lot of focus for Canada to have rel reliable, resilient, broader trade corridor infrastructure. Certainly the Port of Vancouver is doing some major projects. They've got to get over some environmental uh, um, decisions to, to, to further increase their, their capacity. I know that the Port of Singapore made a significant investment in Halifax Port that will hopefully provide the capital and the global reach to increase that port. But the trade, you know, being ready for investors is, is, is certainly a key component. Um, Emilio, I think you might have a perspective on this. The Government of Canada, a couple of years ago, released an IP strategy. I think it's fair to say that Canada's ability generally to generate, to commercialize, uh, to protect IP at the SME and large scale um, organization level has not been great. And I think in a couple of days, the government is going to follow up with an invest, uh, um, investment asset protection um, program. And so they're going to be helping companies do exactly that, generate, commercialize, and protect IP so that when we're getting foreign investment, we're keeping more of that IP here and commercializing it and leveraging the value it has. Do your clients have a view on that as Canada being a laggard or finally catching up with the rest of the world? Well, um, 
amongst the, the compelling um, offerings that Canada has uh, is certainly, um, I was a university professor for 18 years, so I'm, I'm very connected to, uh, to um, intellectual uh, proprietary uh, values. Um, it has been an issue for many, many years. Uh, should the government solidify protection over intellectual property? Certainly that would be a major, major uh, uh, contribution. Um, have I seen that as being a huge hurdle? To be honest with you, not as much as it gets publicity, uh, primarily because, I mean, if you have the, 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 uh, the labor and you have the raw materials and you have access to channels, you're, you have other types of protection. Uh, of course, if we're talking about something that's entirely digitized, then it becomes more important. If it's more attached to something physical, and I agree that today with 3D printing and so on, just about everything has become digitized, uh, but I haven't seen it as a, as a big hurdle. Uh, you mentioned ports, and I feel compelled to add the Port of Montreal, which of course allows uh, um, uh, importers to access central the United States through the access to the Great Lakes. It's a huge differential advantage. To me, compelling, attractive reasons are always competitive. And who are we competing with? With the United States for American mar for North American marketplace. And uh, in terms of competing with the United States, we do have advantages, uh, some of which have to do with a very period-driven uh, situation. I mean, we've seen many rules make it very difficult for people to go to the United States. And we've seen some of our clients um, get lucky, quite literally, because there were unbelievable talents in, in uh, California and San Francisco who could no longer show up for work. So the organizations reorganized, and many of them came to Montreal, so we got to see them very And from England, too, they came to Montreal. Uh, from European uh, countries came to Montreal to service that. That's been a huge advantage that I think that should not be underestimated. Uh, taxation from a competition point of view. We've seen the United States adjust their corporate taxation. I believe that, uh, I, I've always believed that corporate taxation is, uh, is uh, fictional, meaning uh, somebody at some point in time decided to create corporate taxation, but at the end of the day, the consumer is paying it anyway, so it's the taxpayer. And I would crush the rates on corporate taxation because they're, they're just one added layer, unless, of course, the money's not getting distributed. So if it's not going out of salaries, dividend, or interest, or something like that, then I, I believe they should reduce the tax rates and make it even more compelling. And we mentioned some of the other things that make Canada a really compelling uh, uh, environment to invest in. I understand also that the minister, the federal minister of immigration, does have a plan that he, uh, he put forth at the end of October of 2020 that sees immigration climb to uh, over 400,000 uh, by uh, 2021. And that should also have a component of immigrants that are already in business in their own country. So those are entrepreneur or immigrant investors who are accustomed to running big businesses and would bring with them their markets, their country, their know-how and create employment here. Yeah, no, I think you ended on a great point there and uh, the immigration um, policy going forward is very aggressive. And I think we have the, um, the demand part of that equation. We need more people and we've got this side where it's almost unfathomable five years ago to think that uh, cities like Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal would recruit more tech talent than Silicon Valley, Seattle, and Washington, D.C. combined. But that's the reality. And so we've got yeah. the, the supply and the demand component there. One last very quick question before we go to the audience, and I'll start with you, Emilio. I referenced how the COVID pandemic has reduced global capital flows. Canada is there much better than most countries. It'll take a while to figure out why, perhaps. But what are your expectations for global flows coming back to normal post-COVID? And what are some of the maybe geopolitical considerations that might affect that? Just a very that's, quick touch base on that. Yeah, that that's a great question, Ian. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an extremely positive thinker. So please uh, bear with me for a second. Um, I think that the fact that there's a vaccine that's being rolled out um, doesn't change 
certain some some damage that already took place. Uh, I believe that a lot of damage has taken place, more than people can imagine, and most of it is hidden by um, uh, tax incentives, enormous tax incentives. I and mean, I'm not criticizing the tax incentives because the alternative would have been catastrophic. Uh, and to think that, uh, let's say everybody's vaccinated by, I don't know, September 30th, 2021, that on the next day everything's normal, that's, that's not going to happen. Um, so most likely we have a situation that will endure um, uh, into 2022 and maybe 2023. And I would point out that averages are no longer meaningful. So you can't look at the stock market with averages. You really have to segment into 12 or 15 industries, some of which are way up and will continue to be way up for a period of time, and some of which are way down. And of those that are way down, some were already in sick industries that the, the illness was just accelerated, but that the pattern was already there. And others just need time. They need time. People will travel again. People will eat in restaurants again. So you can't just take an average. You really have to look at them by region, large versus big metropolitan city, by industry, some of them being upswing, some of them being downswing, and give it time to be able to, to, be able to recover. I have tremendous confidence in entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs always figure it out, and they will figure it out again. Super, super good point. And um, you know, it's funny you referenced the stock market, and we now know that global stock market capitalization has reached hundred trillion dollars, which is the highest ever. But sixty percent of global stock market capitalization is in the United States, which is also a new high by a significant margin. There was a bear market during COVID. It was the shortest bear market in the history of capital markets at 34 days. So there's, it really makes you think about what does new normal look like in terms of global investment capital flows. Malcolm, what are your thoughts based on your discussions on when we might return to more normalized global capital flows? And is the new US administration gonna impact that at all? What are, what are your thoughts there? Um, so, first of all, I'm very bullish on the market as well, and, and part of it is because of the trends that we've seen here and the actual investments that are occurring. So, I appreciate we're in right, wave two in Canada for COVID in many of our regional locations, but I will say to you that we are starting to experience a good flow of, of capital back into the market, which was a change from wave one, which we saw a lot of capital being parked on the sidelines and waiting to see how things go. So I think there's one, a better understanding of how to manage COVID. Two, I think with the vaccine, uh, you know, being rolled out as we speak. Mm -hmm. And three, I think, you know, as we create more rapid testing, that will start to bring confidence back into not only the individual systems or individual citizens, but companies. And I think Canada is extremely well positioned to be able to capitalize on that. In addition to, Canada remains a very solid place to invest when you think about some of the changing geopolitical factors that are going out in the world that, as Emilio mentioned, were pre-COVID pre and are going to continue. And I would say to you, I think the U.S. will remain somewhat uh, American-centric regardless of who the president is. So I think we shouldn't you know, expect things to change dramatically in terms of buy American first or some of those, but I think it's going to be an easier relationship to create a, those ongoing investment opportunities between the two countries. Thanks. Right. And Laurel, do you see some light at the end of the tunnel? I did reference that Canada is faring much better than most of our competitors through the COVID uh, investment flow decline, but what are your thoughts on what, what it looks like on the other side and how we're positioned? So, I mean, what we're seeing is the foundation of technology is everything. Everything about technology is talent. Talent wants to live in a great place to work and the COVID has taught us you can work from anywhere. So we are seeing, um, you know, major tech, ICT, FinTech companies um, grow their footprint um, in Nova Scotia, grow their footprint in Canada, uh, you know, uh, mid-tier, smaller cities benefiting from that because People are choosing where they want to live 
And you don't need to be uh, taking the subway into a large office tower anymore to do that work. So I think that that is a real advantage for some of our mid-tier cities like Edmonton and Halifax and, and then other smaller uh, regions across, uh, across Canada, as long as we have strong connectivity. So um, I'm excited about that. I think you can work from anywhere. And I think that that um, is a great uh, part of what we offer in Canada. Um, and in particular, I'm proud to talk about that coming out of Nova Scotia. I didn't answer in your first question, what do we need to do? Um, to drive FTI into Canada, we need to do um, more Canadian sort of Team Canada virtual type events, because that is the piece that is the most different for our daily work. I run an investment attraction team, an export development team, a film team. The film and export, I mean, they're, they're running the same, we're running things virtual. On FDI, we're finding our footing as to how are you gonna do global FDI work when you can't go visit people and they can't come and see you. So we have to find ways to uh, bring our uh, secret Nova Scotia flair uh, through the internet, I guess, and, and, and talk about Canada in a different way uh, without having them come and put their feet on the ground here with us. So that's Indeed. something that we have to work on. Yeah, super great points. And we're certainly moving towards the notion, not the notion, practicality of virtual site visits that we're working on. Exactly. Um, but to your earlier point, certainly broadband is going to be an enormously important uh, role for the government to play to make sure everybody's got the access um, so they can live in rural Nova Scotia and still run their business or be part of a business. I can't help but notice the uh, spike in activity in real estate in rural Nova Scotia. Activity's up and prices are up and people are actually And the population is growing. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's We've really, seen uh, a wonderful thing to see. Um, almost right on cue. We're just a few minutes behind where I wanted to get to the uh, audience questions. So, Mark, back to you if you can... Uh, facilitate some of those questions from the audience to the panel. That's great. Well, thanks, Ian, and the panelists for um, uh, the, getting, getting the discussion going. And as I uh, said to folks at the outset, we'll be taking questions via Slido, which the link is in the chat function if you want to pop a, a question in there. We have a number that have come in already, so I'll try to get through as many as we as we can. So. Um, how about the first one I'll send to Emilio. It's actually a question about the Investment Canada Act and whether the national security reviews, if any, had any impact on uh, investment flows. So Emilio, do you want to take that one? It's a very good question. Again, um, these things get a lot of publicity, but in reality, uh, in the SME space, uh, uh, very little um, uh, pops up or blocks a, a transaction. Um, we... Um, I can't say, I mean, as with anything, when it comes from another country, there's background checks that have to be made and nobody can come into Canada and get permanent residence or a passport without of having gone through a, an entire process. This also applies uh, to boards, especially majority held boards uh, of organizations coming into the country from elsewhere. But there hasn't been any scandals, which is a good thing, um, uh, in, again, in the SME space, but also in the largest, larger organizations. So it's good news. That's not one of the hurdles that's really a big hiccup in making a transaction. I must say that I spent most of my career uh, buying or selling businesses. I love buying them. I hate selling them. I love buying them outside of Canada, and I hate selling them in Canada even more. Um, great. Thanks, Emilio. So we have a, a question that's come in here on uh, diversity and inclusion, which, as we know, has been a big priority for uh, the federal government and the, the prime minister. Um, and this question was around both uh, inclusivity from a, a geographic standpoint for rural Canadians, as well as, um, you know, gender. And I, I think maybe gender sort of female owned businesses. Um, so maybe, Laurel, since you opened up that uh, discussion, can I put that question your, your way? Sure. Well, uh, in, uh, in Nova Scotia, we've had an, a, a parallel agenda to that of the federal government about diversity and inclusion, looking to um, better support our women-owned business, our diversity-owned businesses, um, and make sure that our um, economic footprint is growing across the whole province. So, um, I, you know, I think that those are great agendas for Canada and for each province. How does it drive FDI? 
Um, it strengthens uh, the governance of our institutions. Uh, you know, I, I know having worked on the, um, the resolution where the Ontario Securities Commission brought uh, the, uh, the profile of women on corporate boards up into the, uh, that public domain. We know that companies who have diverse boards of directors, diverse leaderships, are better governed, um, and these are good business decisions. So I think Canada is already recognized as a, a jurisdiction with a very strong governance regime, a very strong disclosure regime, and these issues with respect to diversity um, help drive that governance agenda. The other piece ties a little bit to something that Amelia was saying. Diverse organizations mean that there is diverse connections uh, to the rest of the globe through diaspora connections, and that strengthens the ability to understand another market, uh, be able to sell to that market, and be able to see trends that might exist that then we can uh, develop product, products and services in Canada and sell to the rest of the world, as we have for a long time. Great, thank can you. I add uh, uh, diversity in competencies and diversity in age groups uh, as being two other uh, very important components especially in technology, age is so irrelevant. You just have to make sure, in order to make sure you don't have blind spots, governance is so improved by that. And if I could just tap on that broadband 5G question again between rural and urban, it is critical. And there's a company called TELUS uh, that many of you may know, but they're about to drop $16 billion in Alberta to connect rural and urbans together on 5G. So I think there's a real recognition, and as the federal government releases the, the spectrum, I think in the spring, again, if I'm not uh, mistaken, I think there's some real opportunities to see that connectedness and the diversity that we get from rural and urbans working collectively to create real opportunities in this country. Okay, thanks, Malcolm. Um, so Mason, maybe Malcolm will stick with you for the next question. Um, it, it's, it's in and around the, uh, I guess, the difficult political environment when it comes to uh, natural resource projects and particularly from you know what we see in civil society and NGOs and the opposition um, has that been a barrier for your work attracting foreign companies to come into the Canadian market knowing what they do know about the political landscape for resource projects yes uh, no answer so much about it and I'll give you an example uh, as you know there's LNG Canada being built at Kitimat it's about a 40 billion dollar project uh, I was in conversation with one of the countries that are a key investor in that, and this is this is in February, of, so it's pre-COVID, and they were concerned about their national investment in that project, yet it's got regulatory approval, political approval, judicial approval, and by and large, First Nations have all signed up for this particular project, and they were still concerned about their investment. So I think it's important that we recognize that as we go through, so it goes back to the broader ESG, that we need to be conscious of what we say in a domestic context is viewed by international audiences as something that may not be in the same light that we're trying to take it in a domestic context. So I advocate that we really need to get our ducks lined up uh, in terms of how we communicate and what we communicate, particularly on the environmental front. Uh, and uh, I see things like hydrogen as the opportunity to start to create some real alignment federally, provincially, and regionally on some of these bases that connects to all the groups and our citizens. Um, I will also say to you sometimes that we, we are not recognizing the opportunities that are being lost because of some of these policies. So we know when there's a, a, an investment lost, but we don't know when there's an opportunity lost. And I will say to you that there was a $10 billion investment in our natural resource sector that was delayed and I suspect gone now uh, because of the rail blockages we had for three months. Um, and people need to understand that those losses are occurring not because of COVID and not because of ESG, but because of the challenges sometimes we face on trying to resolve our own, uh, you know, movement of goods, services and people across this country. So that's very important for us to, to continue to work on. Thanks. Um, so, Ian, maybe I'll put this question in your direction, which uh, you posed to all the other panelists, and that was around the, the U.S. Uh, angle and how we're competing for investment. Um, wh what are you seeing at the national level, and is the impact of the U.S. election uh, sort of bearing anything on Canada's competitiveness to attract that uh, capital from companies? 
Yeah, I, you know, the United States has historically and continues to be roughly 50% of the FDI that comes into Canada. And so whether it's Greenfield or business expansion or M&A activity, half of it roughly comes from the United States. I think what we've seen in the last few years is for a variety of reasons, Canada has been more of a focus, a spotlight for multinationals who have said, if there's kind of a protectionist trend in the United States, and it's going to be more difficult to land there and to recruit talent there, are we able to serve the North American market or even the global market from Canada in a seamless fashion? And I think the activity we've seen that, that the data bears out is that companies from all over the world are starting to make that decision, that they can easily not default to serving North America from the United States, but look first to Canada and build significant operations here, whether it's in technology or life sciences or advanced manufacturing or resource sectors. I think the last few years have put a bigger focus on the advantages that we've always known that Canada has. Investors are figuring out it's very easy to deploy capital here and serve the North American and global markets. Whether some of that will be undone if there's a more progressive administration in the United States, I don't know. I just think that the tone that has been set in recent years might be hard to undo with respect to uh, trade conflicts and immigration uh, issues. Thanks. Um, so we'll try to fit two more quick ones in before we uh, draw to a close. This one's actually from uh, Brendan Galloway, who's asking about FDI and um, what are we telling investors about our readiness to export agriculture products? And I think this speaks to the question about uh, access to 1.5 billion customers through our network of, of trade agreements. Um, I don't know if maybe Malcolm, you want to take that as a Western Canadian? Yeah, I think I think that's an excellent question. So I think what we're what we're trying to do now is be a little more strategic and a little more focused on where our gaps are in the supply chains, and then sort of create the necessary business cases that are products to take to market. And a small example in the Edmonton metropolitan region is we built a business case out on a pulse fractionation requirement. And as we've now taken that product to market, we held a webinar where we had, believe it or not, 21 different countries represented. 114 people attended the webinar and all the business levels were in the C-suite, CFOs, CTOs and things. Uh, and we're currently working on six opportunities that came out of that webinar on that specific uh, that specific uh, business case requirement or product that we've taken to market. So I think Canada is very well served. As we all know, we're going to be a net exporter of food uh, in the next 20 to 30 years, one of only six or seven nations that will be doing it. So it's to our advantage to start building out that supply chain. So really starting to create opportunities that are focused to start really uh, marketing it in a way that really attracts investment for those specific projects. Malcolm, is, is the growth primarily in value-added uh, foods or uh, generic fruit foods? Um, well, I would say to you it's value-added products as well yeah. as technologies, right? Um, food Same tech and, uh, and ag tech. So um, one final one, we'll see if we can get a quick answer from someone. It's around uh, bioscience companies, and there's a question about um, what are the funds or supports available for that industry? I don't know who wants to jump in with that. I can very quickly address it, sorry, Amelia, but just in terms of life sciences and very research intensive investments coming into Canada, I think certainly the TRED program um, is available to companies doing significant research and development projects in Canada. I think Shred can be more focused on some of the big game-changing uh, companies that are coming to Canada. It's a very favorable environment. And the other one is the Strategic Innovation Fund, where the government will partner with a greenfield project by certainly life science companies, but anything that's going to do research development leading to commercialization in Canada. Sorry, Emilio, you were going to go. Uh, I, I agree with you entirely, and I would add just one other comment that's um, uh, way understated, and that's that um, most provincial and federal uh, subsidy programs don't care whether they're going to a Canadian organization or foreign organization. If you hire a scientist in Toronto or in Montreal, and it qualifies for uh, scientific research tax credit or labor incentives, they get it even if they're foreign in exactly the same way. So that's a very big sales point. 
And just one last point, Mark, the same that Ian mentioned for biotech uh, is the same for clean tech as well. And Canada is a great jurisdiction right now to be doing that clean tech uh, R&D and investment. And, and that is a conversation we are having around the, around the world. Great. Well, Laurel, I'll give you the last word with that. And um, let me just say thank you to all of our panelists, uh, Ian, Malcolm, Emilio, and Laura, for your uh, excellent contributions. Um, we had a couple of questions, unfortunately, that we were not able to get to, but maybe I'll follow up with the panelists afterwards to see if they have any resources that we can share with you. Uh, and, and apologies also to Ian for mispronouncing your last name. I, I said Mackay instead of McKay. That was uh, my mistake, which I take on the chin. Uh, we'll, we'll get it right for the next one. <laughs> All right. Well, um, with that, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, for those of you that we won't see again on another webinar, have a good holiday season, and we'll see you all in the new year. Bonjour tout le monde. Thank you. Bonjour tout le monde. Merci. Bonjour, mate. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bonne journée. Salut.